Labyrinths is brought to you by Knox Robinson Productions. Please consider becoming a patron. For as little as $5 a month, you can listen to Labyrinths ad-free. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson to learn more. <laughs> you got any other uh, single parents out there? Any single dads? Any? I see some future single dads. I saw some single dads. As I'm a, a single dad, I got two little boys, and it's, it's awesome. It's tough being a single parent, though. Like, especially for me, because I still got the car seats in the back. Like, when you're out on a date, you got two constant reminders that you're not very good at pulling out. <laughs> My oldest son, he's at the age where I no longer see him naked all the time. Like, when they're babies, you see him naked all the time. You're changing diapers. When they get a little older, just when it's bath time. And now he's, he's like eight, so he does everything by himself. But I took him swimming the other day, and I uh, saw him naked, and I got really proud. <laughs> I think my son is well endowed for his age. But there's no way for me to really go online and check to see if that's true. Feeling lost? Then you're in the right place. I'm Amanda Knox. And I'm Christopher Robinson. And while we're working hard preparing for season two, we've got another fascinating bonus episode. Of, of labyrinths. That was our friend Jack Ballard. He's a single dad, a comedian, a UPS driver, the host of a tabletop gaming YouTube channel called Rerolling Ones, and an all around great guy. But a few years ago, Jack started disappearing. He stopped showing up to parties. He stopped doing stand-up. He even turned down an opportunity to roast us at our wedding. Chris asked me if I would roast you guys for your wedding. Mm-hmm. I wasn't mentally there. Yeah. I was just like, oh, I couldn't do that because to be a comedian, you know, I was quick. I was, you know, I was, mm. and just having that taken away where you're searching for right words to say and you're fumbling and you're not yourself. I would embarrass myself. Mm. Mm. I didn't want to burden people with my problems. I felt like I could handle it. Jack wasn't just disappearing from the world. He was losing himself. I was like embarrassed because I'm this new, weaker version of me. I just felt weak and just like, this doesn't end well. I'll just go away and die. It's fine. Let's rewind a bit. Before Jack's life started falling apart for mysterious reasons, it seemed to us like he was on top of the world, especially since, in a lot of ways, Jack started from the bottom. I didn't even graduate high school. I wasn't a bad kid, but everybody in my family were like gangbangers, drug dealers, all that stuff. Mm. I have a sister who has nine kids. She has custody of one. Drugs, all that stuff. Grew up in a bad neighborhood. And so nobody cared how I did in school. I would get the question, do you want to go to school today? And I'm like, as a 16-year-old kid, like, no, nah, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> and so for the longest time, I wasn't that confident in myself. I felt like I was an accessory to my cousin. Hmm. And he was like my leader, hmm. even though he was younger than me. That's around the time I met Jack, through his cousin, who was a close friend. We all played a lot of video games. But while most of us were starting college, Jack was in a different world. I was so far behind, and I was just like, well, I can get my GED. And then, you know, I was just moving in with the guys all going to college. And I equate it to going to another country. Like, you guys have been to Europe before a couple times. Hmm. That's not something I can do. Honestly, I didn't even realize this at the time. To me, Jack was just one of the nerd crew. Back then, we were all working at UPS as box loaders on the frantic, sweaty graveyard shift. We helped Jack get a job there. I was 315 pounds. I never even hugged a girl, let alone like any interaction. So I went from eating Spam and drinking Dr. Pepper all day, playing video games, to moving my body. I remember my first day back from work. I got home at nine. I slept until it was time to go to work again at three. Because <laughs> I was just so sore. But once I'm doing something, I'm good at it. I'm really good at what I do. 
And then, because I was losing weight, and then I was like, well, why don't I try to lose weight? Jack lost over 100 pounds, and he did so quickly enough that he ended up having to get his excess skin surgically removed. And then, you know, I'm 22 in shape. All of a sudden, like, girls, hey! Hey! Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm still me. I'm in a different vehicle, but I'm still the same driver. So I still have my same hangups, fear, rejection, you know. Well, from my perspective, you went through a radical transformation from your teenage video game self to like amazing dancer going to the club, oh, doing yeah. stand up comedy, <laughs> Jack. <laughs> your vehicle, yeah, yeah. which is what I saw, <laughs> you know, was just way different. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you gravitated towards performance and towards stand up comedy, which is a place of like ruthless ultimate rejection. <laughs> <laughs> You can't do that world unless you can get used to bombing. Yeah, or like saying something, they take offense to something like, oh, no, this is, Mm. oh, man, I didn't want to hurt your feelings. Mm. I just thought this was funny. Turns out you didn't think it was funny. Jack dove into stand-up comedy as hard as he had into weight loss. He was doing five open mics a week, sometimes driving between different cities to hit multiple clubs in a single day. He even started dragging me to open mics. Chris is a good dude. Like, he's funnier than 90% of the comedians I knew out there. <laughs> he's a funny, funny, funny dude. And, like, my favorite thing was I would come up with a joke, and then Chris put his seasoning on it. Mm. Like, you should do this. The fact that I did three Comic-Cons, Chris <laughs> did 80% of the work of the joke <laughs> that I did. It was a Star Trek joke, and we were at Emerald City Comic-Con together. And was that the Deep Space Nine thing? What was yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was the fact that I wanted some Star Trek posters because I love Star Trek. And I found Cisco, who's my favorite character, one of my favorite characters, Black Captain. And I looked at the sign, and the sign said the posters are this price. And I bought it, and it was cheaper. And then Chris made the joke, it's because it was black, oh. that it was cheaper. And then I was like, that is hilarious. <laughs> and like, taking that joke, that got me into doing nerdy <laughs> jokes as well. So that was really cool. You get into a room where there's 500 other nerds, and they get every reference you make. And it's like, oh, mm-hmm. this is easy. Eventually. Jack graduated from the open mic circuit in Seattle to hosting events and then actual gigs. I was getting booked every weekend. But I get my kids every weekend. While I had gone off to grad school, Jack had stuck around at UPS, eventually landing a coveted and well-paying job as a driver. He got married, had kids, got divorced. He wasn't just an up-and-coming comic. He was a single dad. And you realize, like, oh, I was prioritizing comedy over my kids. I'm like, hey, mom, watch the boys. I'm going to go out, perform. And then, of course, I'm out late and I have some alcohol. And I'm useless Sunday. Mm. Yeah. And then I have to drop them boys off. Jack had come a long way from the Tacoma ghetto, from 315 pounds and video games all day. To me, he looked like he was killing it. But it didn't feel that way. I was half-assing it through life, doing good enough, you know. I was letting life happen to me. Have you ever gone to a party? It's your friend's birthday party. They said, hey, I want you to come through, but you want to go to the club. I want to go out dancing, but it's my friend's birthday party. Roll through. Okay, we're having fun. And then you look down at your watch and it's 1230. You're just like, oh, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm doing. Hmm. No, I'm 10 years from retirement. I guess I'm a UPS driver now. And I guess I'm a dad. Yeah, I guess I'm a dad. guess I'm like, it's happening to me. I didn't want to be a UPS driver. Yeah, life is happening to you. And then- your body starts betraying you. Yeah. What's the first thing that happens? I think it was my last Comic-Con I performed at. Like two weeks before, this nickel-sized plug of hair just disappeared in the back. And I was like, what is this? And then I, a bigger one here. So I shaved my head and I'm just like, okay, I guess it's got alopecia. And I was just, okay, I'll be bald. And people are bald. Around this time, Chris's second novel, Deliver Us, was published. And we asked Jack to open the book launch event with some stand-up. This was the first we heard about what he'd been going through. So last year, I got all the hair on my body just fell off. I went to the doctor. He said, oh, you have alopecia. He's like, oh, that's my cousin. I know her. (laughs) But having alopecia has taught me some things. Like, I got to appreciate the small things in life, like eyebrows. You don't really appreciate those (laughs) and how weird you look until they fall out. He was still able to joke about it back then, but Jack was struggling. What did that do to your self-image of, you know, your, do you feel like a handsome man when you're- No, no, not at all. Not at all. You feel feel like a pariah, a freak. 
what hit me was when uh, my eyebrows started going away. Mm. As I look in the mirror, now I look like I'm sick. Little did he know, things were about to get a lot worse. We could give you lots of reasons to support Labyrinth on Patreon, including ad-free episodes and exclusive patron-only content. But why not hear it direct from a listener? My name is Henry, and I've been a supporter of the Labyrinth podcast for some time. I can totally relate to the concept of feeling lost, and I think the stories have helped me tremendously getting through these last couple of years, and I think they would help others as well. Visit patreon.com slash Robinson. So I've been getting migraines since I was like 12. I'd get them like once, twice a month. And occasionally I'd get really bad ones where I'd have to go to the doctor. Wow. He'd give me some stuff and it would kind of make the migraine uh, background noise, but it would be the sort of Damocles. It's going to drop at some point and I'm going to be doing something and then I'm going to get that little effect. There goes my day. Then one day that sword fell. I was headed to work and I just didn't feel well. And then I started getting a migraine later that day. Bad one. My lips go numb, facial droops and stuff like that. I'm trying to remember the names of stuff. And trying to figure out what it was took months. Yeah, what were all of your symptoms? There was fogginess. Yeah, but... fogginess, numbness. And when it was real bad, not being able to remember if I just delivered a stop. I spent like 10 minutes looking for a package that I delivered already. Mm. And I'm like, I'm not there. What is wrong with me? And of course, you can't do stand-up like that. Hmm. So I went online. I was like, okay, I have MS. What happens with MS? Your body turns against itself. The white blood cell starts eating the connective tissue in your brain, I think. Whoa. You know, you end up in an iron lung, not being able to breathe. And how quickly does that have an onset for people with MS? It can be 14 years, or you can live a long time with it. There's no cure. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm like, oh man, I have the worst thing possible. I went to a neurologist, and the first thing she says to me is like, you don't have MS. What do you know? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. I have MS, obviously. I wanted to get an MRI. And she was like, I don't think your insurance will cover it because you don't have MS. I was dating a psychologist. We dated for like nine months on and off. She thought it was all in my head. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Because I was like, I was having like panic attacks and stuff like that, and I was like, it doesn't feel like it's in my head, but she's telling me it's in my head. Then I went to a nurse and I told her what my girlfriend at the time said. She said, well, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I go to my old doctor and I explained to him, I was like, dude, I have MS. <laughs> and I told him my symptoms. He was like, all right. He sent me down for an MI. I'm like, finally. So this is where my life is over. It doesn't end well. So you're sitting there thinking your whole life is going off a cliff here. Yeah. Are you worried about your boys? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, I need to provide for them. How much did you let them in on? Nothing. You kept it private from them. This also coincided with their mom got diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh, oh wow. wow. And so I'm like, I'm not going to share this with them because they have enough on their plate. Were you worried that it could go bad on both sides and yeah. they would be orphans? I was very worried. I went and got life insurance. Wow. So I was like, well, I'm going to die soon. But the thing is, Jack already felt like he was halfway gone. I forget the, um, what it's called. It's like some boat where it's like they keep replacing the pieces. The ship of Theseus. Yeah, that's it. That's it. The ship of Theseus is one of the oldest thought experiments in Western philosophy, dating back to 400 BC in the writings of Heraclitus and Plato. And it's designed to highlight the paradoxical nature of identity. The idea is roughly as follows. King Theseus of Athens has a ship. Over time, as planks decay and nails rust, they are replaced with new boards, new nails. Eventually, no original components of the ship remain. Is it still the ship of Theseus? What if the old components, stored in a warehouse, are used to rebuild a ship according to the original design? Now there's two ships. Which one is the true ship of Theseus? I always thought if I had amnesia, I wouldn't be me anymore. Because me is all the experience that create me. 
And now I'm not quick. I'm not sharp. I'm bumping into things. I'm not me. I guess I'm a new me. From the migraines to the alopecia to what seemed to be MS, Jack was transforming bit by bit into some other unrecognizable person. His girlfriend was telling him it was all in his head, and in a way, she was right. For when he finally got that MRI, they did find something in his head. I had suffered a TIA, and it's just a nice way to say micro stroke, which is just a nice way to say stroke. I had a stroke, and I'm like 36, and they're trying to figure out what caused it. And so I go through more doctors. I'm like, I still think I have MS. Well, they need to do the spinal tap now because... <laughs> well, you had alopecia, and then you got MS, and now you have a stroke. It's just yep. things are piling up. So I go to the cardiologist. They do all these tests. They give me EKG, and then they ultrasounded my heart. Okay, well, all right, we're going to do one more thing. We're going to stick a camera down your throat. And I'm like, no. That's the point when I said no. Like, <laughs> you're you willing to do a spinal things. tap, yeah. but you're like not willing to swallow a tube? I, like, no, come I, on. I, was just, I was just fed up because I'm going to all these doctor's appointments. They're saying nothing's wrong with me. And I'm like, there's something wrong with me. I've been in my body my whole life, and this is not how it works. And so they stick the camera down my throat, and they see that I have a little hole in my heart. It's called like a PFO. That's a patent foramen ovale, a small hole between the atrium chambers of the heart that normally closes after fetal development, but fails to seal properly in about 25% of people. So you were having a stroke because you had a hole in your heart? How does that work? So stroke is like you get the blood clot. Yeah. They think the hole shot out a, a small clot. Ah. And they send me to see a specialist. And this guy is like, he is on it. He was the coolest doctor. I could tell he just had this energy. And he was like, ah, oh, okay, we're going to put this in your heart and put a little mesh. The flesh is going to grow over. You're going to be good. So I'm like, fine, do what you're going to do. I'm still feeling bad. So they do it. They put me under and they go in through your groin to get to your heart, which is crazy. And they put the little mesh and your flesh is supposed to grow over it. And they give me the test to see if the hole closed and it didn't close. Like the bubbles are going from one chamber to the other. They said, okay, we're going to give it more time. Come back in a year. So another year goes by. Jack's fate still uncertain. Another year of not feeling like himself. And then... I went back and they did the test and they said, all right, you're good. We don't have to see you ever again. And I'm just like, okay. So I got back into eating healthy, exercising. I'm off my blood pressure medication and I just take aspirin every day. That's amazing. I mean, it's... It's interesting that it took so long for all of these professionals in these fields to figure out, like, you knew that something was wrong with you. And I love that you had a go-getter cardiologist. <laughs> um, so how soon after that did you start feeling like you? So I haven't had a migraine since the surgery, which is, I would say, a year and a half ago. I would say i had been feeling myself for probably since August last year. And so I'm like, oh, I get to live. I got another chance. I'm thankful. I'm excited. Ah, what a crazy story. I mean, I can't believe that you were dealing with this all, like, how long did this saga go on? 36 to 39. Wow. That's almost very similar to me, where it's like you had three years of feeling like your life was over. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people like you guys didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't want to let people in. Maybe I should have. I didn't want people to worry about me. And so I didn't get on Facebook and share, because I've had terrible stuff happen to me as a kid. But I didn't want that to dictate who I was. I don't want that to be who Jack is. Mm -hmm. The worst thing was like keeping it to yourself at work and they want you to go over there and do this and go do that. And you're just like, if you only knew. Yeah. Uh, and you're just like, all right, I did what I can do. I went and got life insurance. I'm not going to go cancel my life insurance now, but it's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't need this anymore, right? Yeah. But, uh, Fake your own death now. <laughs> <laughs> It is a good reminder, though, that you never know, like, what's going on with a person. 
whoever it is who's in line in the grocery store with you or you don't know what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. So it would be nice if people were kind to you yeah. during those times. If, you know, my girlfriend at the time was telling me this is mental. I'm like, I used to not look down, maybe even look down upon just like, oh, you're mentally weak. You can't handle it. I can't believe I thought that. We're all people. We all struggle. And so having a second chance is like, oh, man, I'm so thankful. I feel so many parallels because when I first came home, the last thing that I wanted my life to be about was this thing that I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And like the only way that I was really able to sort of wrap my brain around what my new life was, because of course I'm changed by it. I suddenly have a whole new perspective about life because of it. So I'm not letting it define define who I am in the way that everyone else might define who I am. But I am acknowledging that there's something like I know now because of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do something with that. And it sounds like that's what you're doing as well, where you're like, I'm not the same 22 year old kid that I was mm -hmm. before all of this happened to me. And I like that. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a good place to be, man. <laughs> yeah. I was broken. And now I took that and I became a better person. It's part of me. And now I'm this new and improved individual and I'm ready to take on the world. Reforged. You're like Aragorn's sword. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so what is it like to emerge into this new lease on life while the entire world falls to shit? Like, that's the truth right there. And so, like I said, like I had a great 2020, but you can't come out and say that because it's, <laughs> it's been a bad year for a lot of people. But like, man, I have grown as a person. I've never been as confident as I am now. Oh. I've never been a better dad. I've never been more present. I'm very comfortable being me. And I, I'm excited for the future. Yay. That's well, awesome. you're looking great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my hair is back. <laughs> um, didn't expect that to happen. That. But yeah, I, I feel great. You know, when you have something taken away and then you get it back, you become thankful, but it also feels like you were born on Krypton <laughs> and then you come to Earth. I feel like I have superpowers. Aww. I'm like back at the gym and excited to be there. What is it like to suddenly have your world of possibilities open to you? You take less for granted. Like, okay, I don't want to forget this. I want to make sure I keep this positive attitude because it's easy to fall back into this guy I've been most of my life because I was taking everything for granted. Mm. I try to be positive, but also confident and don't take shit. Don't take shit when there's not shit to be taken. Don't like try to find a fence and everything. It's a weird balance. It's so easy to share your opinion. And it's also easy to get shot down for sharing an unpopular opinion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have thoughts on all kinds of stuff that doesn't go in line with what I'm supposed to think. People can try to destroy your life. Yeah. And so he's like, I want to say this, but is it worth it? You only have so many days, right? You really want to spend them fighting with people on Facebook? Exactly. And even things like, uh, so we do this YouTube channel and I got tagged in something. It's like, follow this YouTube guy because he's black. Oh. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, don't follow me because I'm black. Follow me because you like what I do. Yeah. And you enjoy me. But I didn't want to say anything because I know their intentions were good. And I didn't want to be on the, like, fighting with these people. Because I would joke around, like, black is the fourth coolest thing about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's in there. But I'm, I'm, I'm dope with other stuff. I just happen to be that. <laughs> just because I was raised in multicultural areas. You know, you get to see different cultures and see that people are people. Mm -hmm. They want to do good for their kids. They want to succeed in life. That's what they want. Not only is Jack not wasting his breath on the ever-raging culture war, he's gained a level of self-confidence that can only come from thinking your life is over. Now I'm, I'm trying to not be a nice guy, but be a good man. I don't want to set myself on fire to keep somebody warm, else warm. You just become more confident in what you will and will not tolerate. I, I stopped tolerating like casual disrespect. I'll be like, hey, can you not do that? Don't casually disrespect me, please. Because I look at that person when I was married and I'm like, I don't recognize him. Hmm. I view him as weak. I'm stronger now. And so I know if I would give myself advice to that guy, I wouldn't listen. <laughs> so I'm like, I wouldn't listen. <laughs> You're like, oh, like, yeah, there's no way. But I'm like, trying to go forward and be better, especially with this new lease, because I thought it was over. My son told me this a couple months ago. He was like, 
I was in my drama class and they asked the class who is the most confident person they know. And he picked me. Aww. I'm like, oh man, you're not inside here, but it's, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> you got to fake it till you make it. <laughs> have you told the kids in the wake of all this? Have you brought them back through this saga? Do they know now? No, but I'll send them a link to this. Yay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. This is where they'll find out. I'm like, oh. All right. <laughs> but they've noticed a difference, I imagine. Like, they've noticed a difference in you. I think so. The first year when I got divorced, it was eating me up. Hmm. Like, where, where are they at? What are they doing? And now I make sure to call them every day. Uh, it makes it easy because my son has a phone now, and I don't have to go through other people to talk to my kids. Yeah. So I'm seeing how they're doing, making sure they do good in school because nobody cared how I did in school, and I want them to know that I care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm ready for week on, week off custody. They're 13, almost 14, and 12. I want to imbue wisdom and knowledge and all this stuff to them, and so I need more time. Mm-hmm. And now that's going to be a battle because I'm sure their mom loves them as well. She's doing great. She's recovered. I love them too. And so planning for the following year, okay, I'm going to have to live in their school district. That's going to have to happen. It sounds like you're being a lot more intentional. Proactive. Mm-hmm. Responsible. I mean, you said life felt like it was happening to you. Yeah. doesn't feel that way anymore, huh? No. And being conscious of that, because it's easy to fall back into that comfort where I lived. Because I like being me, you know, but I'm like, I want to be improved to me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be the best me I can be. The synapses are firing, and I'm just like, okay, that can be funny again. I'm thinking things. I'm like, I went to a show two Fridays ago, and I got the itch. And I was watching the host, and I was like, I can do better than that. Shit. <laughs> One of the things I came up with as a joke, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't even know if this would be funny. But to me, it's funny. So when I was a young man, I used to think it was gross when old men dated younger women. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm an old man, I think young men should mind their fucking business. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know, having that back, I feel great. So, Well, thanks for sharing, Jack. I know this stuff has been very private for you. Mm-hmm. I'm really glad that you're at where you're at right now. Thank you. Thank you for uh, asking me to share it because it's like, oh, people care about me. Mm. Mm. Because sometimes you like you get into your own life, your own world, and you forget. Oh, I have really close friends. Well, we're glad to have you back. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm back among yeah. the living. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy how someone right next to you can be so lost without you even realizing it. It's a good reminder to check in with your friends and family, and to be kind, to never miss a chance to express gratitude. Speaking of. Thank you for listening and for the five-star reviews. Really, it means a lot to us. This work is our passion and our survival. Stay tuned. Next time, we've got a fun interview with Cheryl Hines from Curb Your Enthusiasm. In the meantime, get lost with us. Find us on Twitter, at Amanda Knox and at Man Under Bridge. And if you want to support our work directly, check out our Patreon. We just launched and we've been releasing special patron-only content. Trust me, you'll at least want to watch the crazy launch video we made, complete with sci-fi canisters and fog machines. Patreon.com slash Knox Robinson. If you choose to support us, we'll be thrilled and humbled. This episode was written by us, edited and sound designed by Chandler Mays, with theme music by Josh Budo Karp. In the Labyrinth's podcast system, the listener is serenaded by two separate but equally important hosts, Amanda Knox, who brings authenticity and empathy, and Christopher Robinson, who brings intellectual curiosity. These are their stories. What do you think, Knox? Looks like a podcast junkie shot up with one too many ads. Should have become a patron from the looks of it. Who wouldn't prefer ad-free episodes and signed books and live video hangouts over overdosing on ads in an alleyway? Don't patronize me, Knox. Leave that to the listener. Visit patreon.com slash Knox Robinson.